And you better believe I am grateful that we took on the machine and entrenched forces that held this city back for far too long. And regardless of tonight's outcome, we fought the right fights and we put this city on a better path, no doubt about it. Obviously, we didn't win the election today, but I stand here with my head held high and a heart full of gratitude. Good evening, Chicago, and welcome to our live 2023 election analysis. I'm Darius Hillman. Joining me at the main desk tonight is the host of Political Forum, Sylvia Snowden. Our new host of Chicago Newsroom and our chief political analyst, Andy Zopp, will be joining us throughout the hour as well to provide analysis and inform insight on an election unlike any we've seen in recent history. Decisions made by Chicago voters last night were historic and will impact life in the second city for years to come. Let's begin at the tippity top of the ticket, Chicago mayor. For only the second time in 40 years, an elected incumbent mayor will not earn a second term. After winning all 50 wards and 76% of the vote in 2019, current Mayor Lori Lightfoot was denied a second term by Chicago voters, receiving only 18% of the vote for a third place finish. And the man who came in ninth just four years ago finds himself this time around in the poll position, winning 34% of the vote. That's good, but still not the 50% plus needed to avoid a runoff in April, which means Vallis will be going head to head with the second highest vote getter, Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson, who received 28% of the vote. Jesus Chuy Garcia, who forced former Mayor Rahm Emanuel into a runoff back in 2015, finished fourth place this time around, receiving just shy of 14 percent of the vote. Garcia, who hedged his bets by getting himself reelected to Congress before tossing his hat back into the ring for mayor, returns to Washington to continue representing Illinois' fourth congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives. And perennial candidate Willie Wilson fell short yet again, coming in fifth place with 10 percent of the vote. Coming in in sixth place was J. Ma Green, receiving 2 percent of the vote. In seventh place, Cam Buckner, receiving 1.8 percent of the vote. Sophia King took eighth place with 1.3 percent of the vote and in ninth place Roderick Sawyer who received less than one full percent point 42 percent to be exact he received that of the vote okay so before a single vote was cast we already knew that the city council will look very very different come May as 16 current alder people have opted not to return and while some have decided to retire Others, like Sophia King, left to run for other offices. And others, like Ed Burke, find themselves sidelined by federal corruption charges. In short, change was afoot and inevitable. And looking at some of last night's key races, one theme played on and on. Runoff, runoff, runoff. We'll start with the first ward, a highly competitive four-man race that included a rematch between former Alderman Proco Joe Moreno and the incumbent Alderman Daniel Laspada, who unseated Moreno in 2019. For Moreno, the comeback story came to an end with him losing last night, coming in dead last with 7% of the vote. Incumbent Daniel Laspada currently stands in first place, and this is interesting. He has 49.2% of the vote. He's hoping that mail-in ballots will push him over the 50% thresholds in the days to come. Otherwise, he too is headed to a runoff against Steven Schneider, who finished second. Now let's look at the fourth ward and the seat vacated by Alderwoman Sophia King in order to mount her unsuccessful bid for Chicago mayor. Illinois State Rep Lamont Robinson is the top vote getter, securing 46.17 percent of the vote. If his current percentage holds once all outstanding votes are counted, Robinson will most likely face second place finisher Prentice Butler, Alderperson Sophia King's chief of staff in the April runoff. But a mere 60 votes separate Butler from the race's third place finisher, Ebony Lucas. So we're probably looking at a recount for second place and a runoff in this contest. On to the fifth ward. In a seat vacated by the retiring Leslie Harrison, Desmond Yancey is the top vote getter. Yancey is currently the senior director of organizing and advocacy for the intercity inner city Muslim Action Alliance. He's going to face City of Chicago former chief engagement officer Martina Hone. 
Next up is the sixth ward where a whopping 11 candidates were vying to replace outgoing Alderman Roderick Sawyer, who just wrapped his unsuccessful bid for mayor. Moving on to the runoffs are the pastor and the police officer, William C. Hall and Richard Wooten. Hall earned 24 percent to Wooten's 23. On to the 11th we go, which after historic remapping last year became the city's first ever majority Asian ward. Seven candidates were revived. Seven candidates were vying, rather, to replace Lightfoot appointed Nicole Lee. Lee currently serves as our top vote getter by the slimmest of margins. She will face Anthony Carabino in an April runoff. Lee received 30.52% of the vote compared to Carabino's 30.3%. Lee was most recently at United Airlines serving as director of social impact and community engagement. She is the Chicago's first ever Chinese American alder person, if you can believe that, in 2023. She was appointed, appointed in March of last year to replace Alderman Patrick Daly Thompson after he was convicted of tax fraud. Caravino is a trainer with the Chicago Police Department. Now over to the 21st Ward, stay with us, where there were seven candidates vying for the seat left open by incumbent Alderman Howard Brookins when he announced his retirement after his unsuccessful run for Cook County Judge. Going head to head in the runoff will be the top two vote getters, Ronnie Mosley, who survived the last minute controversy about where he went to college and when or not he graduated <laughs> to win 25% of that vote, and Cornell Dantzler. And here we go. We're coming up on the first break. When we return, Can TV Live election analysis will continue with thoughts and insight from our very own chief political analyst and the new host of Chicago Newsroom, Andy Zopp. Stay with us. I'm Melissa Donaldson, and I like to call myself a curious boomer. Through that curiosity, I have found that when we engage with people from different generations, we are more alike than we are different. On Generation Flex, we will discuss the day's most interesting topics and discover each other's unique perspectives together. Join us Mondays at 7 p.m. on CanTV19, CanTV.org, and on the new CanTV Plus app. The players, the politics, the problems, the people. For more than 25 years, Political Forum has given Chicagoans access to the biggest names and issues with one-on-one -on -one sit downs with the city's major players. I invite you to join me, Sylvia Snowden, for a brand new season of Political Forum, where our show will be bigger and better than ever. Tune in Wednesday at 7 p.m. on Can TV Channel 19. The world is watching Chicago. Chicago is watching Political Forum. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't been this happy since my son returned from Afghanistan. And I want to thank you all, old friends and new, for joining this campaign. It's because of you we are in the second round. And welcome back, Chicago. Joining us now is one of the most recognized and respected names in Chicago, Can TV's chief political analyst and the new host of Chicago Newsroom 2.0, Andrea Zop. Hi, Andy. Hey, how are you, Sylvia? I, I'm trying to make it. Well, I mean, what a night, though, right? I know. It was okay. uh, yeah. interesting. And, to and, to and, say uh, the least. <laughs> not, uh, maybe not surprising to some, but uh, certainly an in interesting night. It surprised me. I'm <laughs> So what I really want you to help us do is just make sense of all this. The two folks who've made the runoff, we have Paul Vallis and Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson, two very different candidates with two very different philosophies. What worked for each of them? Well, look, Vallis uh, this time fought hard and really on the issue, the key issue in the race, crime, right? He, he started crime, he finished on crime and safety. That was his ticket. And Brandon Johnson had something that a lot of the other candidates didn't have, which was not only the support of the CTU, but their dollars. And we know that in politics, dollars matter. He was able to get on the air with camp campaign and TV commercials very early on and raise the awareness of his name. He also is a smart, intelligent, and articulate candidate and an experience, has experience of being a commissioner and those things, I think, helped elevate him above the rest of the pack. Okay, and you know what? I, I had Brandon Johnson on Political Forum, and he said that his top issue was public safety as well. But it sounds like he has a very different approach than 
Paul Vallis, so do you think that what we're seeing is like a, the philosophies of Chicago kind of battling back and forth, like a tale of two? Well, sure, absolutely. I mean, Paul Vallis is definitely more, much more conservative, very strong supporter of the police. He had the backing of the FOP. He's very close uh, to John Cantazera, the head of the FOP. Brandon Johnson is very progressive, has actually used the phrase defund the police, although he backed up from that very just a quick, little bit, just yeah. a little bit. <laughs> um, but I think his philosophy is we need to have the police, uh, as he's expressed it, but we also need to have other support, mental health services. The challenge for him will be those are great things. How are you going to fund them? Ooh, okay. So, so speaking of that and kind of how we get all this done and our current mayor, Lori Lightfoot tried to get it done, now she's out. Do you think that what happened last night was is more or less a, a rebuke of her? Or do you think that these are really the two people that folks are most interested in seeing in office? What do you think happened there? Well, look, absolutely. Uh, Mayor Lightfoot had some challenges, you know, in terms of people were, were angry and upset, particularly in public, in terms of safety, right? Mm -hmm. It was a big issue. But I think some of that was very unfair. I think if you look at Mayor Lightfoot's actual record, particularly when you talk about the pandemic, you know, people, it, you know, pandemic time's kind of weird, but we kind of forget. Uh, the pandemic had a huge impact on Chicago's economy. Uh, she, we are coming back from that. Uh, and she also had all the unrest to deal with right after George Floyd uh, was murdered. And so uh, brought us to very many ways. But for people who don't feel safe, um, which many people in Chicago do not, that was a burning issue and people were upset with that. Um, so I think that was a challenge. The fact that it was also a very crowded field of mm. African Americans in particular, because if you look at where uh, Mayor Lightfoot did well, very well, she won all of the, the South, South and West, and West Side Ward. Even so, where so, Brandon Johnson is on the West Side. But her margin of win was much smaller than some of the wards that Paul Vallis won, where he was winning by 50, 60 yeah. percent. She's winning by 30, 33 percent because there's a large pool of other African Americans drawing votes from her in those wards. So you have to think that if that pool wasn't there, she might have had been able to have a much stronger showing. Well, then let's lean in there a little bit more. Did too many black folks run? Look, I think, you know, it's America. Everybody gets a chance to run and state their case. Yeah. Um, but I do think, as I said, that it, it may you can definitively know that it cut into her base. Mm. Okay, so we talked at the top about some of the aldermanic races that we thought were interesting, but there are a couple of others that I thought were really fascinating. So talk to me about like the 28th Ward. What happened there? Well, thing I, I think on the just on the west side generally, on the 28th Ward, uh, Alderman Irvin, the 29th, 29th Ward, yeah. Alderman Talafiero, and the 37th Ward, Alderman Mitz, all incumbents, all had all incumbents for a significant period of time, all had challengers, all survived, and so I think that speaks strongly to their base on the west side, and I. I think that they, as a group, will have to be taken seriously as they sit into, in the city council because they have a strong base of support on the west side. But other incumbents did well. Deborah Silverstein on the north side, a longtime incumbent, had a challenger there who felt, had stumbled because of some very yeah, ugly some tweets, face, uh, yeah. tweets and posts that he had. Um, but she also came in very strong uh, as well. And so I think we had a number of spots. Uh, Matt O'Shea on the 19th ward yeah. did very well. So I think it was. There were incumbents who did had strong had strong showings in a number of wards. I think that's important. The other really interesting waste is that we've talked 34th. about the 34th yes. that used to be the 34th ward that used to be Roseland. Yeah. Now it's downtown. Yeah, and, and that's so, another one of those situations where that older woman got in, indicted for right. that Alderman situation. Right, Carrie Austin got indicted and so uh, wasn't running, um, but she, she would have not been living in the ward anyway once it was restructured. Yeah. But that race has features Bill Conway, who, who won the race pretty, pretty uh, handedly. Stuck yeah. handedly. Um, who was running against, um, I'm sorry, who ran against Kim Fox. Yes, the, uh, for state's the, attorney state's in 2019, and, sure. And lost that race. But is also the son of Bill uh, Conway, the head of the Carlisle Group, a billionaire. So he's coming in and saying he's going to uh, bring, also have safety and increase safety in his ward. So we'll see uh, how he fits into the city council. Okay, so I have to ask you this. If we have the runoff tomorrow, Given everything that happened yesterday, what we see, who do you think comes out on top? 
You know, I think, look, uh, Paul Vallis had a very strong showing, but if you look at the where Lord, uh, Mayor Lightfoot did really well, we just talked about that, and you think that there's a high likelihood that a significant percentage of those wards will lean more towards the progressive African-American candidate, um, I'd say it, it's, uh, you know, that there's, uh, uh, that Brandon Johnson has a strong pathway to be mayor. But it's still, there's a lot, there's, you know, there's six weeks coming of, of uh, that's going to, of, of campaign campaigning that will have to happen, and I think it's going to be an interesting election. What I hope mostly is that it doesn't divide the city. I think there's some real potential for that. If you look at where the votes came from, in fact, mm -hmm. there have already been a couple of articles about that. Um, you know, a whole set of wards predominantly went um, for uh, Mayor Lightfoot and for Brandon Johnson, and all of the wards that went for Paul Vallis are predominantly... Um, Caucasian wards. And I was going to ask you, lean in a little bit there. When you say divide the city, are we talking racially, along socioeconomic lines, along ideological lines? Well, divide I'm talking both racially and also from kind of conservative politics. You know, okay. Let's face it, Paul Vallis has been p painted and has himself leaned very heavily to the conservative side of the city. We are uh, have been typically a very progressive city. And so uh, what I worry about is that um, some of that divisiveness that we've seen at the national level will Will now come home to roost in Chicago. Oh man. Okay, well, I really want to ask you this. Like, I'm so happy that you're speaking as a woman, I'm speaking as a woman, because one thing that was not lost on me last night was the fact that Lori Lightfoot, the very first black woman to hold that office, was a one termer, as was the only other woman to ever hold that office, Jane Byrne. What do you think it says about us as a city that the only two women we've ever had serve as mayor have been one termers? I think it's, you know, it's a little disappointing. Right? I think you, you do have to question whether or not you know, if they have a harder road to hoe, if people are uncomfortable with the leadership of a woman. Mayor Lightfoot was a strong woman. She was a former prosecutor. She prevented, she was very direct. Uh, and that made some people uncomfortable. You don't like to think that it was the fact that you see to have that people would just couldn't get comfortable with a woman leading the city. But you do have to ask yourself what you just, the point that you just made, which is, you know, we've only had two women mayors and neither of them were able to make Make it to a second term. Yeah, but in fairness, though, was it them? I, I know, you know I was a baby, baby back when Harold Washington was first put in office, giving away my age a bit. <laughs> but I, I remember the stories about Jane Byrne, and she switched up, seemed super progressive when she came in, and then kind of went super machine once she got in. And we heard similar stories about Lori Lightfoot, seemed super progressive, got in, went straight machine. It, was it them, or is it us, or, or was yeah, it them? I mean, look, you know, there no mayor is perfect. Right, ever you can always look at any mayor and find the flaws and the faults. And I do think you just have to ask: Is that a coincidence? Um, of course, you can find things and reasons why people didn't support them. But I do just think it is an interesting and, as I said, disappointing fact that the two women mayors we have had, the only two women mayors we have had could not make it into a second term. Yeah, yeah, because we, we do hear about the attitudes of the male mayors, like we heard about the attitude of Mayor Lightfoot, but it seemed more endearing, maybe. Well, I think it also, you know, look, Rahm Emanuel also was, was often criticized. Yeah. Do you remember, if you remember the commercial he did with the sweater? Yes. He was trying to be like a soft guy. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you have that. I think people tolerate it more um, mm -hmm. when it's a man um, than when, when it's a woman. They tend to be more comfortable with it. You know, I don't like to think that it was, you know, sexism yeah. that underlies it, but yeah. I do think we have to recognize um, that that's just that fact um, and try and overcome that. And also, there was only, the only other woman in the race this Sophia time around King, yeah. was Sophia King, who is an experienced cal candidate who put out very concrete, detailed positions on a number of fronts. She did well in debates, And just too. could, uh, did very well yeah. in debates. In fact, it was scored number one, um, I think, by Chicago Magazine when they rated them. I think got an A, not mm -hmm. number one. The point being, got no traction, right? Was not able to get any traction in the race. And so I think we still have challenges uh, as a country in dealing with women in leadership positions. Okay, and speaking of challenges, the voter turnout yesterday. Now, I'm on social media. I'm in line at the grocery store. People seemed really passionate. So I was thinking yesterday the numbers are going to be off the charts. But when we actually saw the numbers by ward, the turnout was really low. What do you think happened there? 
Well, I think I think the candidates. I think there there were people were challenged with the candidates overall, right? We know p people were disappointed, had disappointment in, in Mayor Lightfoot in her leadership. I think there, uh, Paul Vallis, You know, we just noted uh, in the earlier segment, he was ninth in the last in the last election. Um, now he's won. So I think perhaps there was lack of inspiration uh, on the candidates. But I also think we have an issue with getting people to come out and vote. And as in general, and I think that's still something we have to continue to work on and let people make people understand that it is so important. Last question, and then I promise I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, why, that's why I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was there too, this, this phrase, dark money, um, was there too much of that? Is there too much of that pouring into Chicago elections, and is that, or is that not a problem? Well, look, I think, you know, the whole, the, the Supreme Court decision that allowed uh, there to be basically dark money, I think, was not a helpful decision for uh, the democracy mm -hmm. generally. Be, but it, it exists, and that's where it is, and we have that everywhere, and every candidate can do it, and every candidate and it does, and so I think for now it's something that we have to live with. All right, well, Andy, I am so grateful for you. Thank you so much, Happy and we will be, be right here. back after this. Um, so in a Memorial Day, 1978, um, an intruder came into our home. There was never a moment where it was black and white for mm -hmm. me. Um, it was a bad dude, and um, but unfortunately, people reacted badly, and that's when my mom started to get threatening letters at the Defender at home, and at home saying she was a race traitor and this is what your family gets. Are you tired of the same old programming? Looking for something unique and diverse? Introducing Can TV's Great at 8. Join us every Wednesday at 8 p.m. for an amazing lineup of independently produced shows created by members of our community. With support from Can TV, this programming block showcases the best community produced content in all of Chicago. Tune in Wednesdays at 8 p.m. and discover the best community-produced content Chicago has to offer. You know, they said that this would never happen. I am so freaking proud. <laughs> because we did this. You know, a few months ago, they said they didn't know who I was. Well, if you didn't know, now you know. Welcome back, Chicago, to Can TV's live local analysis of the election season that was. And thanks to the mayoral and numerous all dramatic runoffs, the election season that continues. Doing more unpacking as we all have been doing for the past 24 hours, I am joined by a group of folks who I respect and I admire and I call them friends like family. We're just gonna dive in and try to unpack. This is Tracy Baines, a legendary, um, most recent um, editor, publisher of The Reader, LGBT leader, my new best friend. Um, <laughs> this is Krista Hamilton, um, the, the wonderful president and CEO of one of the largest um, human service organizations, not only in the city, but the state you can. This is my good brother and friend, Stevie Vallis, who is the co-executive uh, director of Chicago Votes. <clears throat> and this is, um, in addition to being the owner of Metis Design, she happens to be the chair of Chicago Can TV's <laughs> board of directors, making her my boss. So that's where you see the nerves. <laughs> Welcome, friends. Listen, I went to bed last night um, working out in my mind the headline. And no matter what you think of Lori Lightfoot, we watch someone get fired on the job. And unless you have no soul, um, so I'm going to start with my headline and then toss it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is what it is. No matter what happens, um, Lightfoot loses. That would be my headline if I ran, if I was doing Chicago Reader's cover or Sun Times or Windy City Times. Tracy Bain, publisher, what would you say? It? <laughs> A new day. Okay. Krista? Mm. Mm, you would say, mm? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here, you do it. Mm. Uh -huh. Top that, Steve. No, no pressure. <laughs> Man. Low voter turnout mm -hmm. brings big change. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Anna. March Madness, but we ain't talking basketball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're off. We're off. Here we go. Here we go. You're all feeling like I do. Okay, so, so let's talk about this. And, and again, let me just say, I am not one thing. So I am the intersectionality. So when I talk about how this impacts, what do these results, and let's start with the mayor's race. So if we're talking about black folk, 
anti-blackness, systemic racism, police consent decrees, CPS. We're talking about Latino um, folks. We're talking about the same thing, systemic racism. Um, we're talking about Asian community hate crimes, the rising violence in a neighborhood that is just outside my front door, Chinatown, which is hard to watch. We're talking about women. We're talking about Roe v. Wade, wage disparity. We're talking about LGBTQ. We're talking about I may lose the right to marry any day now. So. And then we'll talk about young people, which played a significant and not the greatest significance in this race. So what does this, let's start with the mayors. If I, if, if the black voters, what does a Paul Vallis, and I know these are generalities, but what does a Paul Vallis mayor versus a, a Brandon Johnson's four years look like for a black person? I'm just going to call out names. Krista. I, I, I'll get started. Come on. Um, you know what? When I think of a Brandon Johnson of, of administration, you know, I've, I've watched all of the forums. Mm. And Brandon Johnson lives on the west side of Chicago. You know, he's um, had intersections with violence, which is one of my, my highlights um, in the race was public safety because of the work that I do and the people that I serve. Um, so I see a person who can connect with that community. Mm -hmm. He understands the trauma um, of being in a community that has that level of violence mm. um, with his own family sure. and his friends. Um, looking at a Paul Vallis, I see more of a corporate approach to it, right? A, cor a corporate, or he's a con he's more of a conservative leader. Um, so thinking about it from an ivory tower, maybe making decisions that may not connect with the people um, in the in the community. Got it. Anyone else want to take that one? Pick, pick, it, it, black, Latino. Let's just let's potpourri this. Let's dive in. Um, I want to con compare and contrast because we are, this really does feel like for me and for our city, a crossroads. This is an inflection point. There are drast drastic, stark differences between one of these two men who will be the mayor of, of Chicago as we continue to work our way through dual pandemics um, and 400 years that they're catching up with as a um, anti-blackness, misogyny. Um, so, so Tracy, right now, what what does it what does each administration look like to you? Vallis sees the end point of crime, and more cops as a solution. Mm. Brendan wants to stop that stuff before, where the trauma is, where the mental health is happening. Mm. So, I see a totally different approach to solving systemic problems in Chicago. One person who is a Chicagoan, one person who's a carpetbagger, who's gone around the world uh, in a conservative approach to solving problems. I see um, that, that Brandon Johnson actually inspires people mm -hmm. and that want to help be part of the solution. I was disappointed in the turnout. I think a lot of people didn't give him a shot, and a lot of people thought, thought that that was a wasted vote. Mm -hmm. And I think they're going to now have a choice, a real choice to make. And uh, that I'm, I'm inspired by him and his approach to a w range of issues that are on the front end of the system to fix it so that we really do, do have systemic change. Okay. Do you believe that he has, and everyone can jump in on this, there's always that, and we did this four years ago with Lori Lightfoot, untested. But the same time that Paul Vallis was ninth, we, were ha we had a different appetite. We're four years in. Um, is Brandon Johnson even here? Here's something I'm going to talk with. Start with Anna and work our way around. I'm looking at Lee Nicole yes. fighting it out in a district in a ward that is predominantly Asian. I'm looking at a Latina woman finally taking over the seat for Burke. Those those communities had powers to make choices if they wanted to. What's happening there? Why 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 is she as the first Chinese American woman? Why is she in a battle and a runoff right now? What what is underpinning that? Well, I think um, you know that that is. I don't live in the Eleventh Ward, but certainly her being the first Asian American mm -hmm. female mm -hmm. older person to be appointed to the position is cer certainly something that, you know, is it's very close to home. And you want to root her on. And for her to be fighting it out with um, uh, Kevino, mm -hmm. um, I am just crossing my fingers and he's hoping. he's a police trainer. Correct. Yeah. And so that's an interesting war because you've got Chinatown, but you also have Bridgeport yes. where there is predominantly Absolutely. the police force. Sure. So it's going to be very interesting. Uh, I think if she loses, that is going to be, for the Asian American community, 
a bit of a disaster. Mm. I mean, she is the only one representative, and uh, she gives us hope. You know, she gives us that, okay, if we have a representative in city council, then we've got buy-in. And that's one step closer for us to have meaningful change in our community because the Asian community has been silent. And they, they kind of default in a way mm -hmm. to wherever the majority speaks, at least from my standpoint. Does, the, does last night's vote sort of underscore exactly what you're talking about? I think so. Okay, yes. fair enough. Yes. Stevie, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I am also black, um, LGBTQ+, and I'm also a young person. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I'm a lot of these things, but I wanna know, because I walked into the polling station in my neighborhood, and I looked at the very nice older lady, Miss Ruby is what she told me to call her, and I said, Miss Ruby, has it been this light all day? And she said, baby, I'm afraid so. Uh -huh. What, and let me just throw some numbers at everybody. When the polls closed almost 25 hours ago, turnout, collectively stood at 32.1%, which was down from the last. So it was anemic and it got worse. Mm. 507,000 ballots, um, nearly 508,000, cast out of 1. nearly 6 million registered voters. Early votes drove what we saw last night, but people aged 18 to 34 only accommodated for 17% of that anemic number. Mm. Stevie, you run Chicago, you co-executive direct um, Chicago uh, votes. We've had conversations. You and I have been on campuses and universities having these conversations. What is not connecting? Is it a lack of interest in the candidates? Is it a lack of voice? Is it just apathy? Why are we still seeing these numbers with all of the get out the youth vote we've been talking about and hearing an organization like yours is trying to push forward? Young people are voting in presidential elections. Young people are not voting in their local elections. Um, and that's not good, you know? Um, I think it's important that uh, we as folks who are trying to get young people out to vote uh, continue to drill home on the fact that politics is local. It's more local than it is anything else. Um, and the culture of politics in this country is, has always kind of started national and then dwindled its way down to, to home. Um, you know, hopefully this runoff will uh, kind of spark a fire under young people to turn out and vote. I think the dialogue isn't going to be spread so thin between mm -hmm. as many candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're presented with two stark differences for the city. Um, and I think that my hope is that uh, young people see that and are a little bit more inspired to participate in this election, especially since we have a candidate who's saying the things that young people want mm -hmm. to hear, um, which is unique. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity in okay. this runoff. Okay. If the elections, let's say the exact same anemic number of folks like us who voted yesterday, if we take the exact same group and say, okay, you got Dallas uh. and you got Brandon Johnson and the election is tomorrow morning, who is mayor by evening? Anna. I know, I felt good with it too, Anna. I know. Take a minute I, with I, it. I know. I don't know. I, I, oh, and it's like, no, I'm not. Oh, you're, oh, you're, 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 you're punting. Okay. It's <laughs> yes. tough. It is. It's, it's hard. That's, what I, that's how I spent my, my evening in bed last night. So I figured I'd make my friends, like family, join me in that. I mean, from a female perspective, yeah. from a business owner's yeah. perspective, from an Asian American perspective, yes. it, it's, it's a very hard decision. It's, they, need, they need to persuade me. Okay. okay. That's what I'll put. Stevie. I think. So I've been running the numbers myself. I've been turning it over in my head also. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of Chewy's voters are gonna go with Brandon. Um, I think Brandon has the upper hand on the black voters as well, but I also see some Lori and Wilson voters voting for Vallas. Um, and so I just think it's gonna be neck and neck. Uh, I've, I've heard both. I've heard people say Vallas is gonna run away with it. I've heard people say Brandon's gonna win. Uh, but looking at the numbers of who turned out last night and guessing whose voters would go with whom, it's going to be, I just, I still can't come up with nothing. I think it's going to be close. Wow. I think it's going to be really, really close. Um, so, yeah, Christmas. I'll leave it there. I got to I gotta agree with him. I, no. I, just, I just don't <laughs> no, know. No, no, we, I need um, something but I think to hold we, on I to. I think we all need the next six weeks to be convinced, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, everybody, if 
presenting these great mm -hmm. plans, great platforms. Mm -hmm. This is a tough job. Yeah. Um, and, and I think our, our, our mayor, um, Lightfoot, can tell anybody, mm -hmm. right? Hypothetically yeah. speaking, um, on this side of the table, it all sounds great on paper. Mm -hmm. But to live it out, um, one of the things I think I was disappointed with um, throughout all of the, the candidates was there's so much work being done and no one acknowledged that. Um, so everybody mm -hmm. was speaking as if nothing was being done already. Mm -hmm. So I think they need to take some time to educate themselves over the next couple of weeks to see what has been done. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the work that, you know, these uh, aspirational plans, um, they, they need to take this needs to take the time to look and really understand that there are people on the ground there there is work being done I work in North Lawndale crime has went down 40 percent mm -hmm. because of the investments from the the current administration mm -hmm. so I want them that you know before we start new plans and before we roll out you know new platforms and and ideas let's see what has worked um, and then we can build off of that and scale it and I'm gonna jump in before I get wrapped up here you just hit something on the head we talk about this a lot we work in it here communication and giving access and we understand the power of messaging and part of the success of both Dallas and Johnson was the ability to stay on message and do it in a way that was clear and precise mm -hmm. um, is it possible that in a crowded space where there is a lot of noise Mayor Lightfoot may have had a different outcome if she could have what some would say um, getting in her own way um, I, I'll leave that rhetorical. That's what I'll do. Um, but I, so it's so maybe part of that. Maybe over the next six weeks, it really is up to us voters. But a lot of this is marketing and really being a message. We do it all. You do it as a CEO every day, and I think that's part of it in a very crowded market. Last word to Tracy. Well, if you look where Vallis did really strong, it's in races that are not in runoffs. So the runoffs are going to influence some of this. Mm. And the fact that he also had very high turnout numbers in those wards, is he going to be able to get more? Because he had some 50% ward turnouts. And so he might have capped a lot mm. of, of places. And so the runoffs are going to influence a lot of this. Mm -hmm. This is just fantastic. I'll be calling you all tomorrow with more thoughts after tonight. Uh, Tracy, Krista, Stevie, Anna, thank you all so much for being with us. Um, Tracy is going to be my very special guest. Trust me, if you've never watched an In the Arena, watch Tuesday's edition. It's a part of our Women's History Month programming. Share, uh, Tracy shares a personal journey of triumph and just choosing life. Um, but right now, stay with us. Coming up after the break, the myth, the legend, the OG Chicago newsroom host, Ken Davis, joins us with special commentary right after the break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Bianca Cotton, host of Behind the Confidence Mile. Tune in on Fridays at 7 p.m. as I interview women about the challenges they overcame. Tune in this Friday at 7.30 p.m. on Channel 19 for an inspiring conversation with Alex Sims-Jones. We take on clients that we think are going to bring impact to our community, you know, the impacting black people. We care about impacting people of color. We mm -hmm. care about liberal ideals. The thing about history is that when historic stuff happens, the people in the middle of it usually don't notice it. I have a feeling that the last night's election in Chicago was way more historic than any of us realize right now. It may be as significant as Harold Washington's election or the arrival of the second daily in 1989. I say this not so much because Brandon Johnson or Paul Vallis are gonna be challenging any longevity records. We may never see another 20 year mayor as long as any of us are alive. But what I'm thinking is that we're in for a period of rapid, wrenching changes as Chicago and possibly all of America's big cities begin to deal with a level of uncertainty and instability most of us have just never experienced. And something that would have been unimaginable an election or two ago, the big kahunas of Chicago TV News, 2, 5, 7, and Public TV 11, they were just playing regular programming all evening while Chicago's political world was in upheaval. They each confined their election coverage to the normal half-hour slot at 10 o'clock. 
To its credit, Channel 9 was live all evening with an air of urgency, jumping from venue to venue and following developments as they happen. Does any of this matter? Well, I think it does, because what I'm sensing is that local television is slowly, if reluctantly, getting out of the local news business. If that's true, it's a real shame, because for a couple of generations, this mix of newspapers and TV and radio coverage, it was as much a part of the political scene as the government itself. Mayor Lightfoot surprised just about everyone last night with her gracious and early concession. It's never easy for an incumbent to concede. And Mayor Lightfoot had accumulated a bevy of opponents. The reason this is a media story is that it's something you want to see live, not in five-second tick tocky snippets later on. My quick inventory showed that it was aired live on Channel 9, and WBEZ aired Channel 9's audio, and I believe WBBM Radio aired it live also, but WGN's live feed went dead a couple of times, so the mayor's speech got really limited coverage. Turns out if she'd waited just 10 minutes until 2, 5, 7, and 11 went live, many more people would have heard her. I want to insist here that despite my septuagenarian status, I am not nostalgic for the breathless old days of TV trucks and podiums weighed down with scores of microphones with their station flags. It was too often superficial, and it certainly didn't do much to advance the understanding of complex, multifaceted issues. But as commercial radio and TV recede at an accelerating rate and newspapers all but disappear, something, it's hard to describe it exactly, something absolutely crucial is just being neglected. What we're all living through is a repudiation of centralized news dissemination. A handful of reporters summarizing and distributing dispatches about what's happening and what's important. Digital media has made every one of us a TV truck and a printing press. So we're all reporters if we want to be. But of course, no agreed upon standard of ethics or accountability exists yet, and one just never may emerge. So to a degree we've never experienced before, we now get to choose our own reporters. We get to be reporters if we want to be them, but there's almost no way to gauge the accuracy or the bias of what we're consuming. So what we do is we choose the feeds that make us feel most comfortable. Is that important? I think it is. I believe that last night's election returns can teach us something. Lori Lightfoot was probably our first mayor to be constantly and thoroughly scrutinized by social media. Those early days of COVID made her something of a digital star, if you remember. Problem was, she often said indelicate things and sometimes just blew up at those she viewed as adversaries. But so did Rahm Emanuel, and so did Rich Daly. But their temper tantrums didn't get spread around with the efficiency and, yes, the viralness that Lightfoot's did. For at least the next few years, this is going to be the standard. The very importance of mayors, or at least their ability to grab and hold the public's support, may be on the decline. Whether Paul Vallis or Brandon Johnson gets to the fifth floor, both have been elected by highly polarized and ideologically opposite electorates. So expect an outright digital war to break out. In fact, it's probably already broken out today. This could, and I emphasize could, diminish the role and power of mayors. It could have the weird effect of elevating the power of our traditionally timid city council. In fact, it's possible we already saw that during Lightfoot's years, as outspoken opponents on the council got way more exposure through social media than any of Daly's or Emmanuel's opponents ever did. So if you're young, you're living in an astoundingly interesting time. You and the media tools you're inheriting will completely rewrite the rules of politics and may go on to rewrite or even supplant pieces of the Constitution. My generation watched the television revolution from front row seats, but what we experienced was nothing compared to what's coming and what seems to be showing its face in full force on this day after a very consequential election. I'm Ken Davis. There really is no voice more steady and clear than that of the legendary Ken Davis. Joining me now to give a voter's perspective are, three, are four of Can TV's longtime community producers and content creators, Keith McDonald, Naimi Latif, Zelda Robinson, and Al Kindle. Welcome. Good evening, good evening. Let, let's dive right in. Keith, I'll start with you. Did your candidate make the runoff? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. How about you, Naima? No, my candidate didn't. No. Al? Yes. 
All of mine did. Oh, all, all, all of them. mine. Okay, we'll come back to that. Okay, we'll come back to that. Zelda? No. 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 So, so first of all, Al, all of yours came, you, you voted typical Chicago style? Early and often. Uh, more than once? <laughs> so, uh, I'm an active participant, so I not only participated in voting, but also made sure they won all by right. my active participation. Well, terrific. And so for those, for those of us whose candidates didn't make it to the runoff, uh, how are you feeling about um, the, the, the runoff? And what are you going to have to hear um, from each of the candidates to make a decision? I'll start with you, Nate. Well, I think what I need to hear is not so much focusing on the police and increasing police, but really dealing with the root causes of crime, which are economic. And I was looking for an understanding of the distress that is happening throughout the communities, what causes crime, the lack of opportunities, and really the dysfunction in the households which came to the surface when the COVID crisis hit. So if you don't really deal with what's happening with families and mental health, and you just punish those who are reacting to their situation, that's really not helping. That's what I'm listening for in this runoff. All right. Zelda, how about you? Pretty much the same thing. I'm waiting to see and to hear and to feel and to have an experience like that of, of which Dr. Willie Wilson does because people know that he cares for the community. He just, he just does it. Back in the day when I was working at Gospel Radio 1390, Effie Roth introduced me to him mm -hmm. and I found out uh, the work that he's been doing for over 40 years and, and people don't know that because he doesn't brag about it. He just does the work. Right. So I, I agree, I think, hearing about crime. And, and uh, uh, clearly, these two candidates have different perspectives on how they're going to, uh, 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 Vallis and uh, Paul Vallis and Brandon Johnson have very different approaches about thinking about how they're going uh, to address crime. What I'm a little worried about, though, is what else? You know, there's a lot of crime is an issue. A lot of other things go into running this city and running it well besides crime. And we just didn't hear a lot about that, right? How are we going to and continue to support the business community, small and large, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anybody have any thoughts about that or some of the other issues that the city faces? Keith? Well, oh, well sorry, Al. I cut you off. You go, Al. No, no, it's okay. But I think that um, it's clear that in the mayoral race, Brandon has a clear trajectory, although the numbers may not show it, to becoming mayor because of the fact that the white liberals abandoned Lori, as well as many other people. She really did not have a base, although she did do well in winning most of the black wards. So Brandon holds on to the white liberals, and if he expands the black base, and then if he turns to both elevate and register, and then all souls to the polls, he has a clear path to victory, and it's quite analogous to what Harold has done. And so, uh, Vallis, is seemingly to be uh, what some people may call the great white hope. And so consequently, our black community will expand, will respond, in addition to the Latino community, will respond accordingly. But you're absolutely correct that we need a policy and a plan that's pro-growth and pro-educate and offers opportunity in addition to addressing the crime issue. So it's not only about just the crime. The crime is the hot button, hot button issue that is facing us all. But obviously, we got to have we have to let's grow our population, and we need coordination of resources from both the state and particularly the county. And we believe that Brandon is that person who can offer the nuanced differences around social justice initiatives, in addition to addressing the hard economic issues compassionately. Right. So I'm going to come back to the pathway you said for, for Brandon. Keith, go ahead. Well, I just want to say <clears throat> that with Brandon having been the uh, president for the uh, Chicago Teachers Union and things he's done to, uh, to lead up to his, uh, his um, being a commissioner, he has been active and he knows how he's made connections. He's made a network. He's made um, connections with people who can help him with the management of the city. Val has been gone for a while. I'm sure he's out of touch with what is going on now. And I think Brandon is in a lot, lot more in touch with, what's, how to, with those who can help him um, manage the city. 
So I, I, I think um, certainly he has some strong grassroots uh, ties. But Al, you know, you mentioned that um, uh, that you think a lot of the votes that Lori Lightfoot picked up in the South and West Sides could go to Brandon. But you know, uh, you know, Willie Wilson last night when he did his concession speech said, "I called my good friend Paul Vallis." Um, and, and, and congratulated him. And uh, I think uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Wilson has some strong support for Paul Vallis. So what do you think that, and you know, Vallis has picked up African-American votes before. Um, so I'm just wondering, do you think that uh, perhaps that, uh, uh, well Zelda, let, yeah, let me ask you, do you think that uh, black voters can, will, um, can the, uh, move to Paul Vallis, particularly if Mr. Wilson, or Dr. Wilson endorses him? I think some of them will and some of them won't. Yeah. I think that, I, I really love what I saw online today. I, I don't remember what platform it was on. It might have been Twitter. And Dr. Wilson stated that he would ask the communities in which we reside, who do we recommend that we put our folks behind? Sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm clear that you saw we had you know nine people in the race. Mm -hmm. The black community strategically made a decision of who was, who was both strategically positioned in order to represent their interests. I think regardless to whomever endorses whomever, whoever is considered to be, can better represent the black community is whom they will go with. We went with that video already mm -hmm. with Dr. Wilson endorsing a candidate mm -hmm. and then him and their candidate not otherwise coming to a perspective, right? So the question becomes, what's the ass is going to be? And you know, what's the relationship? And, and, and where is the community in that? So um, I think the community's got to make a decision on who strategically represents their interests for the future. And perhaps Valors may be the past and not the future. It is time for a younger generation to begin to take the reins of this city. And he is that generational transformative candidate that we could begin to invest in. And there will be others like him. I'm only just saying him. I'm not saying that he walks on water. I'm saying this is an opportunity for us to, yeah, we want to talk about Harold. I was there. I helped elect Harold. But it's time that we go beyond the shadow of Harold and walk into the future. And that he perhaps offer that, particularly for that generation that are 40 and under, that are looking for a shot to say they can make a difference in this city. And there is a path. Yeah, you, know, you seemed a little, a little less uh, on the Brandon Johnson train. You, do you have some questions or, th or concerns that you want to have him answer? Well, I, I like Brandon Johnson as a person. I think he expressed some good ideas. But one of the things that moved me to support Dr. Willie Wilson was him pointing out some things that really did affect the communities, things like the, the red light cameras, the, the consistent taxing of the poor and the underprivileged economically, and understanding that these are the things that drive a lot of the frustration. So when it comes to perhaps who he might recommend people put their votes behind, he's going to be looking at what policies are candidates speaking of that make a difference. One of the reasons why Dr. Wilson was so focused on economics was because that is at the root of the crime. Sure. And when, when you don't have a budget that is able to draw from anything other than constantly giving fees and fines to those who can least afford it, you're going to create frustration and create crime. So he spoke about building the business community, and he spoke about making it more attractive for businesses to come and invest in the neighborhoods. If, if the next candidate wants to get the votes, they have to think of different ways of generating income and not just using fees and fines and penalties for those who don't have the money to pay it, and then finding them for not having money to pay. Right, understood. Um, let's, we have uh, only have a little bit of time left. Let's move quickly to the aldermanic races. So um, are any of you aldermen facing runoffs, or are you, you know who your alderman's going to be? My alderman, I know who he's going to be. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Lamont uh, Robinson. Yeah. 
I was just facing a runoff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is he, is he? I didn't know. I thought I they said, be. Well, I'm sorry, I misunderstood no, no, no. the, the, the report. Oh, yes, my bad. My bad. I got to go do my homework. Right. See there? I'm glad I was here today. Lamont Robinson, we believe that he is the best candidate. He's at 46%. Right. And I spoke earlier that the other two um, individuals are separated by 60 votes. And so you don't know who the challenger is going to be. But Lamont Robinson is likely to be, but you know, if God say the same. And so from that, it was a difficult race, and we are working. And then in the fifth ward is Mr. Uh, Nancy that we are um, that I'm working to support to be the fifth ward alderman. And so he also is in a runoff. Whatever happens, we know for sure that uh, it's going to be a different city council, correct? So uh, yes, for it, sure, it will be uh, uh, pretty amazing. And whoever is mayor will not have a clear path to do whatever they want. Oh, because yeah, the whole new city council—that's right. for sure. Accountability. Right. So you think that that absolutely that accountability—it's going to be a different time for this mayor, whoever whoever it is. Yeah, absolutely. So I really want to say uh, thank you. Uh, that is our time, and uh, as uh, as uh, you uh, continue to create great content, all of you, and so thank you for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, thank you for thank being you. here. Uh, and for all the credible programs that you've created for your fellow Chicagoans right here on CAN TV. And thank you for sharing your w insight uh, and your perspectives as voters tonight. And we say yeah. in the street, 100%. <laughs> Keep it 100. Thanks, Al. Keep it 100. Keep it 100. <laughs> Darius and Sylvia, back to you. Good grief. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you, panelists. And Andy, congratulations to us and Chicago um, for your expanded role with us as the host of Chicago News Route 2 Portal. These conversations that we're having right there mean the world. We are 20, just under 25 hours after the polls closed. There remains a few open items, to say the least, that will come into fuller focus in the weeks ahead, including Chicago City Mayor Lori Lightfoot pulled it out. Showdown between the FOP and CTU for control of City Hall. And of the 50 aldermanic wards, 14 contests still remain undecided and head to a runoff, including seven contests featuring incumbents, three of which were appointed by our outgoing mayor, Lori Lightfoot. Many questions remain, but this we know for certain. The next six weeks are going to be intense. Buckle up. But trust that CAN TV will continue to bring you hyper local news and analysis you can count on. Each week on Political Forum with Sylvia Snowden and Chicago Newsroom 2.0 with Andy Zopp. And we'll be right back here in Studio A on Wednesday, April 5th, to bring you post runoff election news and analysis with local leaders and amplifying local voices. A very special thanks to our incredible in studio guests and our old friend Ken Davis. And thank you, Chicago, for tuning in on camp cable channel 19, online at cantv.org, and on the new CanTV Plus app. Stay with us, Chicago. The premiere of Great at 8 Wednesdays starts right now. <laughs>